Hi, my name is Taylor Hewson and I'm here interviewing Dean Terrell, uh, currently Emeritus Professor at the Australian National University and also a former Vice-Chancellor. This interview is being conducted on the 15th of January 2013 in the ANU Media Studio as part of a Summer Scholar program hosted by the ANU School of History, supervised by Paul Arthur. The media producer is Jamie Kidston. So Dean, you've been at ANU for quite a long time now. Um, would you mind telling us the story of how you first came to this institution? Yes, it was, it was very interesting. Um, back in the early 60s, um, I hosted uh, a professor of statistics from the ANU uh, at my home in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. uh, and three hours after he arrived, he said, I have something I want to discuss with you. I'd like to offer you a job in the statistics department at the ANU. And I said immediately, I will come. Because uh, at that stage, uh, the ANU had two very famous uh, statistics professors, Professor Hannan in time series and Professor Moran in probability areas. Uh, and so I knew that this was a, a wonderful place to come to, not only to teach, but as I did, to do a PhD together with Professor Hannan as my supervisor, uh, and uh, I did that while I was a lecturer in his department. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like the annual lived up to your expectations? Did it offer what you were looking oh, for? Indeed it did. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in the area that uh, he was famous for around the world, and uh, uh, I found it uh, uh, an opportunity to, to really develop uh, time series and to see the way it could be used mm -hmm. in, in both uh, economics and business. Mm -hmm. So you were at the University of Adelaide um, before you came to the ANU. How did they feel about losing you? Well, I, I don't think they cried uh, or anything like that, but uh, I was a Rhodes Scholar from uh, South Australia, from the Adelaide University, and so mm -hmm. it, it was something that uh, when I was studying overseas at both Oxford and, uh, and MIT, the professor, uh, Russell Matthews at Adelaide, uh, organised for me to spend time at uh, MIT and then immediately offered me a job Mm -hmm. uh, when I completed at MIT uh, and I did spend uh, uh, a very interesting and uh, uh, I think uh, entertaining uh, 18 months or so with them because he was setting up uh, a man manager of business uh, master's degree and uh, he, he wanted me to teach uh, those uh, students how to use statistical and mathematical uh, means in, in their uh, Master of Business areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was very good uh, training for me because I, I, I got involved in that area not only there but also when I came to the ANU and also when I was on study leave overseas. Mm -hmm. mm, so you became Professor of Econometrics eventually at ANU yes. in well, 1971, yes? Yes, I arrived here in 1964 mm -hmm. and the first Professorship of Econometrics was set up in 1971. I applied for it and, and was appointed mm -hmm. at that stage and uh, mm -hmm. it, it was the initiation of econometrics uh, in the area of economics and business at the ANU and I was very pleased to be part of that mm -hmm. because I thought that was a very important area to develop and it has developed mm -hmm. over those almost 50 years now mm -hmm. uh, in, in being an area of importance both to management areas but also to uh, economics areas as well. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel it was important? Oh, I thought it was important to, to uh, recognise that in overseas areas, in both America and England, where I'd, I'd uh, been uh, during my Rhodes Scholarship, it was quite clear that in those areas, uh, the notion of how you quantitatively developed uh, the study of economics and business uh, was very important, and that was uh, something that uh, people with skills in time series could certainly help with, because that's where a lot of the actual data that uh, the Bureau of Census and Statistics and so on uh, collect is mm -hmm. then available for use if you're trying to test theories. Mm -hmm. So it was time series that you really got yes, interested it in? Yes, it was absolutely time series and, mm -hmm. and, and indeed uh, quite interesting as I think I mentioned to you earlier that uh, when I was asked to go to uh, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the person who uh, invited me there was uh, a later a Nobel Prize winner, and he asked me specifically to come and teach both the undergraduates and the postgraduates because he knew that we were so good in statistics and in particular in time series. Mm. 
So what do you feel major, what was your major contribution to the study of time series in, in a few sentences? Well, um, in a few sentences, it's, it's really uh, to find out uh, how you best analyse long stretches of data, particularly, and this is what is a key thing to economics and business as distinct from, say, uh, the other areas of science, because we recognise that the the areas that we're studying evolve over time. Mm -hmm. And so what Professor Hannon and I did quite early in the work we did together was to recognise that if you had 60 or 70 years of data, the model that you had at the beginning might be evolved by the time you got to the end of the 70 years. So we built up systems which would uh, essentially allow for this and be much more efficient than if you assumed every ob observation had the same value. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was important and it was recognised, uh, uh, certainly here and elsewhere, that we had made uh, good contributions in that area. Mm -hmm. So moving forward in mm -hmm. your career, although I think you definitely made serious contributions to this, these academic areas of study, you started taking on more and more senior administrative roles. Yes, yes indeed. Um, why do you think that was? I mean, did you feel like you could give, um, did you enjoy them more or do you feel like you could benefit um, the university more through that? Or? Well, I, I think I had a, a breadth of interest in the sense that uh, um, my statistics naturally made me recognise that uh, it was something that could help in, in not only economics but in business and areas of uh, postgraduate study. Uh, and so uh, I was happy with the way that that had be, been developing. But I also, uh, as I indicated, um, I'd already been become quite involved in the area of overseas students. And uh, Australia and ANU in particular was developing uh, how best they got the information about the potentialities they had to overseas students, particularly in Asia, but also in, in America and in, in Europe. Uh, and so uh, I could see opportunities in that area, not only from the area of study, but also in terms of recognising that uh, Australia could, could develop mm -hmm. its overseas student groups, uh, and ANU in particular could do that. Mm -hmm. So that also became an important part, not only of my academic work, but my outreach work mm -hmm. to areas that were potential areas of, uh, of overseas students coming from. Uh, and how they would be best informed about what the potentialities were. Mm -hmm. So what was your main motivation for wanting to, to bring these international students over or to integrate these systems more Well, I, I thought, I mean, this might be overly optimistic, but I thought that we did have capacities in the areas that we were dealing with mm -hmm. which would attract mm -hmm. the, the best scholars in areas like Singapore and Hong Kong uh, and other areas to know that they could build skills in applications to the areas of uh, both business and economics. Uh, and I, I, I thought that that meant that we would have to have very good setups in terms of information for potentially interested scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a stage when we had 70 areas uh, set up with information opportunities for potentially uh, arriving overseas scholarships or mm -hmm. potentially enrolling overseas scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was an important part of, uh, uh, of development and it had to be done in a way that you looked at uh, the whole issue uh, of how do you get appropriate information to potential areas of scholarly development. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a big task, uh, uh, particularly over that period. If you took from essentially the early 80s onwards, uh, that was a big issue for the development of overseas students in Australia uh, and providing them with very good information was important. Mm. So, and, oh. and needless to say, uh, many of them had a natural interest mm. in economics and business. Mm. So the major role you ended up taking on at the ANU was of course the Vice-Chancellor um, through most of the 90s. Was that something you'd had your eye on before that you thought you might be able to aim for? or? Well, yes, I think the answer is this, that if you look prior to when I started that, I'd been dean of the, the faculty for a period of about 10 to 12 years. And 
what you did as dean of the faculty was interact with people who were other deans and other directors of research schools. And I felt that uh, it was important uh, in, in those terms to, to think about the best way that we developed interactions between people who were teaching and, and researching. So uh, the researchers in, in the research schools would have the opportunities if they had specialist interests to give a, courses in that area. The teachers would interact often and, and, and jointly work with people from, from the research schools. And that was all initiating at that time. Uh, and it was very important to make sure that the deans from, from the faculty areas and the directors from the research school areas understood the benefits to people in both the research schools and uh, in the faculties to have that interaction and to have discussions of mm -hmm. developments and to see how they impacted on both the research schools and the faculties and how that could help everybody. Mm -hmm. So I saw that as a, a natural thing from looking at how the deans interacted and interacted also with the, the heads of research schools on, on various issues. Mm -hmm. uh, it was good if we could then see that being thought about at both the deputy vice chancellor level and then later at the vice chancellor level. Mm. What do you think your biggest challenge was as vice chancellor? Uh, I, th I think the biggest challenge was really to make sure that uh, that inter integration mm -hmm. was well understood uh, and the opportunities that came to both sides Mm -hmm. uh, were well understood and were not seen to be something where this area was trying to push its barrel at the expense of that area, that we were looking to try to get mutual advantage out of, out of those interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was very, very important and took, took you know, quite a lot of time. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was important, and, and this was something I learnt as a dean, um, when talking to people who were in the research schools. But a lot of the developments in the research schools depended very much on the appointment of outstanding scholars. Because when they were appointed, they would often have to then have associated people brought in with them if they were going to make... Many of them had, uh, in a sense, almost a team view of the things they were developing. Mm -hmm. And what we also wanted to see is how that team notion might work in things that were both important to the faculties and important to the research schools. Mm -hmm. And so that was really very much part of the dean side, but then something that was uh, also very important when I was both deputy and, and vice chancellor, because uh, when you have when you started off with a situation where in the research schools their clear fo focus was on research and so on, the faculties had a uh, focus on both research and teaching. How did we integrate that mm -hmm. in such a way that benefited everybody? And, mm -hmm. and that was not an easy task, but one that, had, that we got started uh, and continued to grow through mm -hmm. the 90s. Do you think you did? It was came out fairly successfully in the end. Were you happy with the? No, no, I th no. I think it's it, it has been very successful mm -hmm. and uh, uh, continued to be an area uh, where we have uh, more than the sum of the parts, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's very important. That uh, you know both the faculties in doing the the jobs that they think were very much fundamental to their role, and the research schools fundamental to their role. They also found some areas where benefits would come to both sides if they uh, did have good means of integrating. Mm -hmm. what, what were those benefits? Were you trying to increase, are you trying to save money and also increase research output or are you? I think it was more to, to see how uh, essentially studies of areas could, could be uh, advanced by having teaching not only from the people whose major role was teaching and research, but also some people whose only role had previously been research. Mm -hmm. And they then had the opportunity at uh, certain levels to give mm -hmm. classes, and then that would benefit uh, the, the students uh, and also start to stimulate interests in 
perhaps doing further research mm -hmm. when they finish their degrees and that would perhaps link them from the faculties into the institute again. Mm -hmm. So that was very important I think too. That was an evolution that was very much part of, uh, uh, of, of the 90s uh, and continued into the 2000s. Mm. Uh, more personal question, did you miss being able to do research while you took on these more administrative tasks? Uh, yes, to some extent, but I did, I did do some mm -hmm. research while I was uh, uh, actually in the area and that was, that was encouraged. There's no sense in which you were said, oh no, you know, but I continued to do that and, uh, and, and some of the uh, inspirations that uh, occurred uh, as a result, a result of uh, collegial linkages in that time uh, were also important parts of some of the research I did in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, and and uh, really that's, that's evident. If you look at my publications in the 2000s, you'll see lots of uh, linkages um, uh, between not only me, but some of the students who were uh, working uh, in in the college and uh, uh, various other areas, so it, it was uh, it's very important uh, integration, I think, of uh, of the ideas. Mm. How about some of your other contributions as vice chancellor? For example, I know you spent a lot of time working on the endowment as a very yes. important area. Yes, yes, the endowment for excellence. Uh, well, <laughs> in fact, uh, that was set up um, in in ninety uh, six. Uh, and uh, we saw that as a, a very important issue because a lot of donations were made to this institution and the real question was how do we make sure that those donations are used in the most effective way to support the activities that the donors wanted to support. Uh, and so I had a close colleague, Professor Alan Barton, who died very recently, uh, and he was he was the Pro Vice Chancellor of Finance and Fabric for me, and he appointed uh, two or three very skilled financial experts to start the Endowment for Excellence off and to set uh, a, a, essentially the way in which it should be looked at in terms of making sure that the rate of return on the, on the monies that are donated was very, very encouraging for anybody who looked back to uh, areas they've endowed and to see how that was working. That is that they would see that there was not only uh, an amount which you could re regard as a, a normal return, but there was actually a growth in capital at the same time. So they could look back and say, oh, well, I really did do a good thing in making that donation because not only is it doing the right sort of thing in terms of supporting this area or that area, but it's also uh, producing a sufficient return that allows the capital to grow as well. Uh, and, that's, and, and we've continued to watch that in many other areas. And as I've told you, in, in areas like uh, the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation and the General Sir John Monash Foundation, that's the same big issue. When you're setting up scholarships of that kind, and eight scholarships for people going overseas from the General Sir John Monash Foundation, uh, four to five from the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation so far, and this is only the second year of those scholars, um, they have to, you have to watch very carefully that the money that's been endowed to keep scholarships running is well supported. Uh, and so again, many of uh, the areas who know how well the endowment has worked mm. will put their money in. The Friends of the School of Music put their money into the endowment because they know it's, it's working well in terms of giving them a good return, not only for what they want to uh, focus on, but also in terms of building their capital. Mm. Perhaps we could talk about those those um, uh, groups which you just mentioned, the Sir Rosen Willem Foundation and the um, Sir, uh, General Sir John Monash um, Foundation. What drove you to be interested in those out of all the things which you could have got involved in? Well, uh, <laughs> as, as, as you might uh, know, I, I was a Rhodes Scholar uh, and I benefited greatly by being uh, a Rhodes Scholar and, and the experience I got at both Oxford and MIT uh, and indeed finding my wife uh, in Oxford uh, has been of wonderful uh, 
success from my point of view. But the, um, the important issue there was that knowing about that, it, it just did seem to me that although for many, many years Australians have benefited by road scholarships, Fulbright scholarships and so on coming from Europe and coming from America, I felt that there ought to be for the sorts of people who go for two to three year scholarship uh, development overseas, there ought to be some Australian funded scholarships. And now we have eight of them from the General Sir John Monash Foundation and four to five from the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation. So we've now got 12 to 13 scholars going overseas for what I call long study, that's two, three, four years, mm -hmm. um, and that's funded by Australian bases. Mm -hmm. uh, and that for me was uh, very much a success. It didn't mean I didn't appreciate what the Rhodes Scholarships and what the Fulbrights did, not at all. But I did feel that given that overseas areas were prepared to give us the opportunities that they did, which I greatly uh, was benefited by, mm -hmm. that we ought to have also our own country putting up uh, scholars uh, opportunities, uh, which both General Sir John Monash and, and, and the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation now do very strongly. Mm -hmm. What do you think those benefits are? I mean, what did you get the most out of being a Rhodes Scholar, for example? Well, I, th I think it's, I think it's a, giving you a, a different perspective, um, both in terms of uh, the way in which issues were approached in Oxford, uh, and then when I had the opportunity to both study and teach, in, when I was at MIT, I taught uh, Master of Management students who came, they were people who'd been working in industry in America for up to eight to ten years coming back to do a master's degree. And they found that their quantitative skills, even if they were engineers, had dissipated quite a bit in their role in industry. And so I had the opportunity to teach those master's students the quantitative area, and I found that very stimulating to see the way that they could then get back onto various subjects in the business program with greater, greater certainty of success, given that they, they, their quantitative abilities were, in a sense, revived. Mm. Uh, and so that was, I think that was a very rewarding uh, thing for me and I, I was hoping that that would then give similar rewards to people who got that sort of advantage when they came to do study in Australia, uh, either undergraduate or postgraduate. Mm. One of the other, perhaps the other one big thing that we haven't talked about yet in terms of the contribution you've made is um, Arnet. What yes. was that? Well, Arnet is something that uh, um, Australia has a network for its teaching and research, which is essentially, uh, it's, it's connected to the rest of the world from Perth into Asia and then up to Europe and from Sydney into America and then to Europe. And that means that with a very, very, what's called a very, very large network uh, around Australia, which takes in all of the capital cities and all of the country areas linked to those capital cities, you have the ability of students, if they're, if they're going into an area of study that involves collaboration with people overseas, then they can work on data that say comes from uh, study of the skies, uh, which we've just been hearing about because uh, uh, our area of study at the ANU, both at Stromlo, was hit by the fire in 2003, and now Siding Springs has actually escaped, but not completely, from the present fires. But the important thing for people studying in those areas is often to get data from overseas in large quantities, and to do that you have to have uh, optical fibre, which is uh, essentially very, very large capacity. 
Uh, and if you can do that, you can send data to your three collaborators in different parts of the, of the world. They can look at that, work on it, come back and send back the information to you. But you've got to have a lot of capacity to be able to do that. And so we set up uh, a capacity linkage around all of the universities and CSIRO in Australia. And the capacities are much, much in excess of anything that's going to be part of the present uh, broadband network that is being uh, developed slowly uh, for uh, all parts of Australia. But that's uh, not focused on the academic needs where there's a lot greater capacity needed uh, and a, a lot greater ability to collaborate uh, both in teaching, because again, it offers great opportunities in teaching. Um, and we've had examples here of where we've gone out to the, the most uh, regional areas of New South Wales and some uh, scholars at, at schools in, in areas there have seen things that we've been able to send by video conference to them that they would find very difficult to get to. And they say that, you know, if we needed to do this, we'd have to travel to Sydney or Melbourne and back again. Uh, and, you know, really we can't do that very often. But if we've got this coming in on a video conference whenever we need, and the people at that end and the people at this end can talk to one another and say what they're seeing, uh, it's, it's, it's a very enhanced uh, effect for our studies. Uh, and so, um, I completed my role as chair of the Arnett board at the end of 2012, but for many years that was an absolutely crucial part of making sure that teaching and research could occur on a very wide basis for people living in Australia if they had interactions with people in other countries. Uh, and so it's still true that we've, we've got a very good network, but we're going to have to uh, work hard to make sure that we maintain that ability to keep those very high broadband connections uh, available because all sorts of uh, areas of academic teaching and research do require uh, linkages all around the country, but also capacity to send information backwards and forwards very rapidly. Mm -hmm. If I can ask you one final question, Dean, because we're just about out of time. I know that you've had a great life um, in Canberra and that you've also chosen, I guess, to retire here, although you're still very active. Mm. Um, a lot of people say that Canberra's not a great city, but if you, do you feel like you've come to really like it, to love it? Yeah, I love Canberra, uh, and, and I have since I, really since I arrived. Um, and I, I, this is, this is a, a, a little bit of a, a story, but... Um, when I arrived in 1964, the lake was just being filled. And as it turned out, the engineer in, in charge of setting up the lake was our best man when we were married in Oxford. Uh, and so I think the lake is so much a part of this beautiful city uh, and the things that people want to do here. And it's typical, we're, we're quite close to the coast so people can have access to the coast, but it's also a wonderful place to live. Uh, and we have really enjoyed it. Uh, and as an indication of that, my three children and my grandchildren all live in Canberra. Mm -hmm. It's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.